Right, I'm pressing the button now. Good day, everybody. I hope you had a good Christmas. It is me, Paul Woodadge, again for World War II TV. A very exciting show today because we're Southern Hemisphere. We're in Hong Kong. Three different time zones of presenters today, which made for some coordination. So joining me at 2 a.m. in Canada is Brad Sanqua. Good morning, af morning, afternoon, afternoon, Brad. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. Yeah, early, early morning, I guess you want to say. Um, yeah. But, yeah. And live on the ground in Hong Kong is a resident of Hong Kong, uh, Craig Mitchell. Good morning, good afternoon, Craig. Hello there, it's three o'clock in the afternoon and even though it's in the middle of winter, it's uh, 28 degrees today. So it's a pretty hot day for us. Lovely, so um, well, there we are, we're gonna start. So um, uh, we, we're, well, I'll ask Craig, where are we, Craig? And where are we gonna walk today? Well, right behind me is a, a, a message board here that kind of outlines the route that we're gonna be doing today. This is probably the, uh, the fiercest fighting for the whole of the Battle of Hong Kong, which lasted in this area here a couple of days from about the 18th of December all the way up to about the 20th, 21st. It was still in sort of a, a changing hands. So we're going to be walking along some of the uh, the major spots along this, uh, this trail here and have a, have a look at some of the, the major areas that uh, some conflict took place. Well, superb. So I will let you get going, uh, Craig. And Brad, while you're going, uh, Brad will give us some um, background of the, ba you know, the Battle for Hong Kong and just to start, you know, we, everybody understands that December the 7th was when the Japanese invade Pearl Harbor. But at the same time, the Japanese are beginning their expansion across the most of the Pacific. And I think 70 odd years later, we forget just how quick that expansion was and how many countries and islands they did in a few months that we allies had to take five years to take back. So it was a, it was a very, very short campaign. I think that's why, Brad, in the grand scheme of things the hong kong campaign gets lost amongst pearl harbor and then later on midway and you know as a canadian it's very important to you um the hong kong fighting so um tell us about yourself and how you got particularly interested in the hong kong campaign well well and then i'll put it on, on craig's imagery yeah yeah perfect uh i'm a phd student almost finished almost there got the dissertation in just waiting to hear back but uh at the university of ottawa uh i got interested in the battle of hong kong uh I've always been interested kind of in the war in the Pacific, more from the American angle. But when I was looking to do the PhD, I wanted to do Canada uh, and, and Canada, the Pacific uh, during the Second World War, not much uh, involvement, uh, but the Battle of Hong Kong is probably the best known and the fiercest fighting Canada saw in the Pacific. So I just really wanted to bring that story uh, and kind of remember and commemorate that battle as much as I could, because uh, it often gets lost in the shuffle in Canada with like Battle of the Atlantic and the fighting yeah. in Normandy, Dieppe, et cetera. So it's uh, kind of an area I just want to bring more to the forefront as much as I can. Well, that's good for me because I, I, as I said before going online, I, I know very little about it. You know, I, as a Brit and from, I'm from East Anglia, I know a bit more about Singapore because it was reg regiments from near where I grew up that went off right. and straight into the bag there. But Hong Kong is one of those, those campaigns that kind of has passed me by somewhat. I know a little bit about it. And as I was saying to you go before going online, how little there is on the internet about it, relatively speaking, compared to other events of 1941. But anyway, I yeah. will let you um, and Craig tell us what we're doing and where we're going and just give us a bit about the background. I mean, as, as Craig said there, the battle for Hong Kong was really pretty brief, really, but just take us through kind of the, from the moment the Japanese attacked and, 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 and roughly what was happening leading up to where we're going to be today. Right, so yeah, I can just do a quick um, overview. So like you said, the the, uh, the attack, the Japanese attack begins on the 8th of December, uh, a few hours after Pearl Harbor. Uh, they attack uh, along the border uh, on the mainland, as they call it, with uh, the Chinese area uh, and the border of Hong Kong. Uh, and then they push through to what is referred to as the gin drinkers line uh, fairly quickly. Um, the line was supposed to hold again. The estimates were kind of all over the place. Uh, defense plans had changed literally days before the attack had begun. Uh, so the, the line falls very quickly. I mean, again, we can talk about that maybe later, another show or something, but uh, that falls really quickly. So that starts a real um, push and fall back into Kowloon. Um, and the mainland is basically evacuated by the garrison uh, after several days. Uh, the 11th is when the evacuation is called and it's pretty much carried out fairly well. I mean, considering everything that was happening, uh, but they pulled back to the island uh, and uh, for several days, there was a few overtures um, from the Japanese asking for surrender. Both are rejected. 
Um, the islands slowly softened up by artillery and uh, airstrikes, uh, and the landings take place uh, nightfall on the 18th of December. Uh, and that's kind of when we move into this area where we're going to be looking at now. Uh, so we, we better have Craig tell us what we're looking at now. So Craig, that's yeah. the anti-aircraft position now, I believe, is it? So tell that's us about right. that. This is just below the summit of Jardine's Lookout, the, 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 the actual hill itself. This is above the Wong Nai Chong Gap where most of the fierce fighting took. But this is one of the primary objectives the Japanese had when they were coming into this area. The, the whole reason they wanted Wong Nai Chong is because it's right in the middle of Hong Kong and they wanted to split. They wanted to do a classic of divide and conquer. So they had to come straight to the middle of Hong Kong and divide it in half. And that's what they did within the first hours of landing in Hong Kong. And this is one of their primary objectives was to try and hit this AA site, which is quite high up and it gives them a real strategic advantage for then pushing on to the rest of around Hong Kong. So we're looking at the AA site right now, but I'm just gonna pan down to the road, which is the, what the Japanese used to advance up. And there was also a, another river uh, like a parallel river that I'm going to show you too as well. So just head over now. So this is, yeah, we will, we'll, I'll, I'll show you that, uh, that site a little bit later on there, but okay. that one. But yeah. right down there, you, you can kind of see the road that comes up. That's a very steep road that actually turns and winds around right back on us. So the Japanese advanced up that road. And then also just beyond this sort of a pylon here, which we're just about to go down, the Japanese actually climbed up the riverbed. There were two rivers that we're going to go and see um, along this route here, along the water catchment which the Japanese also used to push up. And uh, it was very steep and uh, hazardous, but uh, they managed to get up here and then assault this uh, uh, this AA site up here. Superb stuff. So, so Brad, so, um, yeah, the ter terrain-wise, um, you know, how did the, uh, the, the the British and Canadians go about defending that and what were their their intentions before the invasion? I mean, how, they weren't, as Churchill famously said, they didn't expect to be able to hold Hong Kong at all, you know, but what, were the, what was their plan uh, should uh, the invasion happen? Well, the, uh, like I said before, just briefly mentioning uh, the fighting on the mainland, the idea was that um, once the lines breached, uh, they would hold on, uh, to the high ground as best as possible uh, it, it, on uh, the island itself. So like Craig mentioned, Jardine's Lookout, uh, Mount Butler, there's some of these famous names from the battle. Uh, they did their best um, in a lot of counterattacking, uh, particularly the Canadian uh, units, the, the Hong Kong local units uh, had to do a lot of that uh, because of some of the other British units like the Royal Scots uh, took quite a beating uh, on the mainland and became basically ineffective once they fell back just because the attack was so quick and had cut them off, a good chunk of them cut them off, uh, as long with the Indian units uh, that were fighting. Uh, but uh, that was the plan to take them back. Um, but again, there was a lack of reinforcements, especially as the casualties started piling yeah. up, uh, of taking the high, high ground. And the Canadians and the local units were able to do that time and time again, but it became exhausting and the attrition really just brought down the number of troops available to keep doing it. And the British troops that would have been there, they, they would have been the regular battalions there on overseas duty. So probably right. slightly older, I'm guessing, and you know, been moved around the empire and, you know. Yeah, uh, so, so there's two regular British um, regiments uh, at Hong Kong, the Royal Scots, um, who were fighting on the mainland, like I already mentioned. And then the Middlesex Regiment, uh, trained as a machine gun yeah. uh, battalion. So they were tasked with holding um, the line, the Gingerkers line, but also the various uh, uh, pillboxes and bunkers that we'll see uh, as Craig moves through uh, the, the trail. Uh, but they were, uh, again, took casualties as well. They would had been in Hong Kong for quite some time, both of them. So there was issues with training, um, malaria had affected the rail squats quite, quite, effect, uh, quite severely, but also rates of venereal disease were quite high, um, yeah. which had taken a toll. And I guess lack lack of up to date training, lack of up to date weapons. There's are still short magazine and it was number four, not number fours. It's you know, they're, they're, they're going to be kind of early 1930s technology rather than kind of brand new 1940s stuff. Bit of kind of lackadaisical over the other side of the empire. And yeah, it's um, yeah, and then yes. a lost cause battle essentially as well when you when you get committed in a sense. So yeah, when you get into uh, yeah, as uh, again I. As the historian, you know, the academic historian, I like to say, you know, we know that with hindsight, obviously. Yeah, of course. But, but just an interesting kind of thing I stumbled upon once was uh, in the war diary of uh, the Rashputs, one of the Indian units, I believe it was the Rashputs, uh, had mentioned actually that the Canadian weapons were new and up to date. Whereas one of the big controversies in Canada surrounding Hong Kong is that they were under equipped with old weapons. So it's just quite interesting to kind of see the 
you know, the contrast between yeah. these new Canadian untrained, supposedly untrained, under-equipped units, and then what's available on, you know, in the colony itself. Yeah, so, I do think one point that's often overlooked with the Canadians uh, with their equipment was um, the most of their heavy equipment, their jeeps, their mortars and stuff, that was stuck in the Philippines. Uh, they yeah. didn't manage to get all of their equipment up from the Philippines. So when they came here, they just had to use a lot of the, the British uh, uh, equipment that we had. So unfortunately, they didn't. All the stuff that they brought with them from Canada, all the heavy stuff, was caught down in Manila and never actually got up here. Yeah, exactly. It was, yeah, it got, it was rerouted when the attack began and uh, the Americans took it, but it fell uh, when yeah. the Philippines fell. But uh, yeah, like you mentioned earlier with what the strategy was and kind of the tactics, it was the lack of transport really did hurt them. The Canadians, the Brits, because they were under equipped uh, even before the Canadians arrived. So it really caused an issue with moving reinforcements, again, that were lacking to begin with, but dwindled as the fighting went on. Yeah. And this is the river that the Japanese, well, one of the two rivers the Japanese would have took uh, to from the lower area down on Cecil's ride up to then attack the AA site um, to the west. And we're now uh, heading to the east towards pillbox one and two. But the Japanese were actually inside this pill, uh, sorry, inside this catch water, just, uh, you know, sort of uh, crawling along. And at one point when they just turned around the corner, they, in fact, one of the occupants from the PB-1, um, they were down there with a Tommy gun. And uh, as the Japanese turned around the corner, they came face to face and uh, had a bit of an exchange. And uh, they managed to uh, capture the Japanese machine gun and then take it back. But uh, yeah, the, the Japanese soldier in here didn't fare too well with a couple of rounds to the face. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, and now, as we can see it, I mean, it's a, it's a hiking trail now, isn't it? And fair, quite, quite a, you know, it's a, quite an exertion doing it it's not an easy stroll is it lots of lots of up and down and it's you know it's for the, the experienced hiker rather than the kind of the newbie i'm looking at it from oh, my absolutely point. i mean the, the rivers that they took now i mean we've been up and down a couple of times a few years ago but no not even uh, hikers these days don't go up and down there you you've got to be like a, a historian to really want to go down there for any reason and then the reason you're with us is you, you know you live there and you have done all this stuff you've been going there looking for bunkers looking for spent cases you've done some work for tv That's and archaeological right. digs things like that so you know you 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 know these sites better than just the casual um you know walker and looking at the views person so um yeah it's uh, it's and great you can stuff throw up that first photo you put on earlier on there paul i think this is the perfect location for this yeah right yeah I don't know. Is that about? That's about as best as a lineup as I can get now. Obviously, there's a few trees in the way. Mm -hmm. um, if you can see, oh, there's a palm tree just down over in the corner there. That is where the police station right uh, is, uh, what well, was, and it's now a private residence for one of Hong Kong's richest people. Uh, the hill right across is there. That's Mount Nicholson. So when all of it was happening down in the gap down at the bottom there, the Royal Scots were at the top. And then you had the Grenadiers uh, uh, down at the bottom, D Company, I think it was. Um, you yep. might be able to see the petrol station down over there and the cricket field, which you'll see as well. But this whole gap area here was where it was all kicking off. It's uh, It looks nice and peaceful today, but you certainly wouldn't want to be here in uh, 1941. Yeah, and we get a good idea of the terrain from that. I mean, you know, these these are serious mountains. I mean, it, you know, I, I've done shows from Normandy where, you know, it's all yeah. very background. And this this is a very different terrain we've, we're covering on World War II TV. So, you know, so... so um, Brad, Brad, you know, take us through you know, the, the campaign. So the Japanese crawling up these riverbeds, things like that. I mean, had the Japanese planned this attack? With, I mean, had they got much um, information about the topography and geography? Had they, or were they kind of just improvising when they when they when they attacked? Yeah, the the, the attack was very well planned. Uh, they were very well um, uh, supplied with intelligence. Uh, again, it's a bit again with sorry, just a bit of disclaimer with Battle Hong Kong. A lot of the details are still debated um, yeah. based on, because of the nature of the battle and what happened, basically everyone's a POW or killed. So again, all the details are very much debated. But uh, with that being said, the intelligence that they had gathered um, through all sorts of service, like all through um, many sources, uh, Japanese army officers integrated on the ground, um, just being able to walk around and take photos, uh, numerous accounts of that happening. Uh, so they kind of, they knew exactly what they were doing and where they wanted to go. Um, but once the battle does start, there are numerous uh, tactical decisions that are made uh, by the Japanese that really lead to higher casualty rates than they probably should have taken. But again, that could be something else we could discuss later. But um, but with that said, they knew exactly what they wanted mm. to do. I mean, we had this on our Guadalcanal show the other day. I mean, the early part of the war, the Japanese tend to be a little bit more kind of overzealous and a, and a little bit less 
concern with uh, casualty rates yeah, that then they are later in the war they they calm down a bit don't they so some of that that yeah. they're, they're brilliant and brilliant in their plan but also can get a bit kind of gung-ho at times can't they yeah and they put a timeline on themselves um which they ended up basically following and and completing anyway but just again the few decisions that were made and how they went about things and uh, some of it was ad hoc like crossing onto the island itself was not done in any sort of organized fashion, but uh, that kind of just carries through into certain elements on the fighting mm. in the island, especially. No, it's great stuff. So, um, you know, obviously that, that we're following the trail along there now, and, and I'm relying on you two to tell me when to start talking about things, because obviously I've never been to these locations. <laughs> so uh, We are just around the corner from PB1 and 2. We're about sort of 50 meters away. So, right. Oh, perfect. Superb. And, you know, I hope you're, those appreciate watching this appreciate the fact this is live images from my Hong Kong. Of course, it's not it's going to be a bit jerky and and the Internet connection. But the point is, we're there live. That's the exciting thing about what we're doing here is that Brad can tell Craig where to turn the camera and I can tell them where to do. And we're doing it all live for you now. So incredible stuff. I, I, I love what we can do with this. technology there. So there's a great view there. That's the, that's a good, good lining up of the, of the kind of the photo we saw earlier and kind of. Again, and uh, we, yeah, sorry, the petrol, sa we, the petrol station you can yeah. kind of see there to the left of that as we're looking at it, that's actually Lawson's bunker. And that yeah. would have been the uh, brigade headquarters. And where the kind of pavilion is now on the side of the uh, the cricket field there, that would have actually been D Company's headquarters, which have now just, uh, been demolished straight mm. after the war. But that's what right. uh, that's where it would have been the location. So we're just going to continue on around the corner to yeah. PB1. But uh, yeah, sorry, uh, just before Craig gave that little detail, I was just gonna say again, we can see um, from that view, especially how important the high ground was uh, because yeah. controlling the high ground and the valleys themselves was an extremely yeah, important part of the battle. It's always about the high ground. Yeah, if you're yeah. on the top of Mount Nicholson, you're almost looking directly down below you. So it's a very steep hill. Yes, yeah, a very steep hill covered in scrub, as you can see, not easy. Um, to, to climb when you are, you know, exhausted from days of fighting, lack of sleep, um, lack of food, lack of even water for certain units, especially, um, and then doing it over and over and over and over and over again. Yeah. Um, like some units had to do. Um, it really takes a toll, um, no matter how well, supposedly well trained or well disciplined the units may or may not be. Yeah, no, it's, uh, uh, one it's, thing that's worth noting, uh, noting about our Hong Kong terrain is that the jungle kind of thing that you see today, these high trees, they didn't really exist. I mean, all of this was within low shrubs. It would have been sort of knee height, waist height kind of uh, bush. Yeah. So all of these trees here, this was all planted after the war. There was a big reforestation program in the 60s and stuff. So what you see today would not have been exactly what it would have looked like in 1941. And in fact, yeah. quite a lot of the old veterans here that were here a few years ago before they started um, yeah, dropping the numbers, I'm afraid. But uh, a lot of the veterans, when we took them up there and it showed them that AA site that we were standing on, they looked around, they didn't, ha they didn't have a clue where they were. They just didn't uh, recognize anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's important to understand that, the, the, you know, the things don't stay the same. The terrain stays, you know, the actual shape of things stay the same, but the, the, yeah. the scrub and the, and the tree line can change so quickly. We get that in the Ardennes, we get that in Normandy, and forests that used to be there aren't there anymore, or vice versa. But, yeah, no, it's amazing stuff. Yeah, it's, so it's just coming up now. We got PB PB two on the left, just over there, with where my dogs are, and then we're actually going to go over the catch water, turn right, and we're going to go up to there, which is where PB were, PB one was, and they were had like interlocking, almost like interlocking fire, where PB one was facing kind of uh, mostly sort of to the south, and PB two facing to the north to try and give each other sort of covering fire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to head up. It's about it's about forty meters. We should just see it around the corner. We've got a question on YouTube for uh, either Craig or Brad. It was, what any idea what the daytime temperature range, range would have been there during the battle? <laughs> well, it wouldn't have been as hot as today. I do know that most of the accounts say that it was kind of cold, wet and misty. So although I don't have an exact temperature to put that to you, I would have said probably around about 18, 16, something around about that. Yeah. Yeah, I read the same. I mean, uh, prior to the battle, there's, you know, accounts of them saying we can only work. They only work certain hours because it got so hot, they couldn't do anything. But once the battle <laughs> starts... Um, th there's accounts of, yeah, it's cold, it's misty. Um, they weren't really well equipped to deal with the temperature drop, I guess you could say, as yeah, it was. It's a, because... The fluctuation is the thing that, that yeah, you, you're either too hot or you're too cold, aren't you? Yeah, yeah exactly. That was a, a, a major element for uh, a lot of the accounts I've read is kind of the fluctuation and all the temperature changes. 
so here we are at one of the famous bunkers. So, um, you know, this um, is the upper one PB1. Brilliant stuff. You can see lots and lots of damage, mostly from mortar fire. The Japanese were very accurate with their 50 millimeter knee mortars. So, um, yeah, a lot of uh, the fire that came through here from the records was uh, from mortar fire. Yes. Extremely yeah. accurate with their mortars. Plenty of spang. Yeah, plenty of spang. The, uh, the, the periscope up there. We can. So when, when were these bunkers constructed? Uh, I'm not well, sure about I this. Think... It, it, oh, sorry, go ahead, Craig. Um, well, I believe it was around about 1936 was when they were looking at trying to redo the Hong Kong defense line. So yeah. I think it was around about then they started reorganizing and started looking at different uh, positions there, moving around some of the big guns and stuff like that. So I would say it's around there, although I don't have an exact date. There might be something on the uh, there might be something on the notice board that I can try and have a look. Mm. I mean, I guess they, yeah. they, 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 that's you know hills like that in a place that they've obviously been used for the offense for, for 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 centuries, and then gradually uh, over the years evolved as what they're putting there. But yeah. Um, he yeah, sorry. It's just yeah, yeah. That's a great shot you can see inside of 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 what the bunker uh, and the space constriction uh, yeah. that there was. Yeah, really badly damaged from the inside. Lots of splatter, lots of grenade splatter and stuff. Yeah, I won't go any further. Other than a loose connection. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But uh, sorry, going back to what Craig was saying. Yeah, that the, there's a, um, a a push, especially within the colony uh, at the time in the in the, in the mid 30s to relook and look at the defenses and try to bring them as best they could. Again, lack of funds, even lack of interest really hurt that. But uh, uh, like I said, the main focus earlier was the was the gin drinkers line. Um, but the same idea with these bunkers is, is trying to do the best they can with what they're given. Yeah. Okay, well, not much else to see up here, but I'll head down now and show you PB2 uh, lower down. Superb. There is a there is a communications trench on your right, but it's just so overly grown that you're really not going to see anything, especially in this kind of green and yeah. uh, the light that we have today. But yeah, there is a communications trench just running a meter off, off the trail just in there. Yeah, superb. So I mean, just I mean, for, for those watching who perhaps aren't familiar, I mean, we know the Japanese are looking for some islands for resources and there's rubber and stuff in it and airfields. But Hong Kong, of course, it's, just, it's, it's a multitude of reasons from from uh, the transport to ports yep. to, I mean, just run through some of the reasons why Hong Kong was so important. Yeah, so from from the British perspective and, and, and defense planning in the Pacific, uh, there's all kinds of reasons, uh, like you just said, of why it's important and why they wanted to hold it. Uh, some are from, are quite practical, reasonable, others are a little, you know, fantastical, uh, more towards the fantastical kind of out there range is using it as a forward base. Um, to attack uh, the Japanese, whether it be in China or the home islands themselves, uh, there's an issue of prestige of the British Empire in East Asia. Yeah, a bit of a Falkland Islands thing kind of going on there a bit, isn't it? It's just about the, yeah. about the ideal of it being part of the empire and therefore important. Yeah. Yeah. And there's other geopolitical issues at stake there as well. You have um, the nationalist regime in China. There's a huge concern that if Hong Kong falls uh, to the Japanese or there's no defense made at all, that they'll lose um, sort of the heart to keep fighting the Japanese or any sort of, mm. yeah, I don't know what the best word is, but more the kind of, uh, you know, supporting the British still. And yeah, well, that's that thing the, the, fight. the Asian kind of, that, there's that kind of thing about face, isn't there? And about prestige yeah. and honor that, that us Westerners don't quite get that same thing of that loss of face you read a lot about in, 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 exactly. in Japan, Japanese and Chinese and what have you. And it's, it's something that's hard for us to kind of grasp exactly what that means, but right. yeah. Yeah, there's concerns for decades prior to the war about, you know, like you just said, like losing face, uh, whether that's with the Japanese, the Chinese, the Americans, um, all kinds of concerns over that, particularly once in 1941 with the geopolitical situation changing yeah. as much as it did um, in that year, especially right with the Soviet Union uh, and how that changes throughout that year. I just uh, yeah, I appreciate again, you know, when you connect these shows I've done together, just how much was going on around the world. In I mean, that's a sort of a, a, a silly comment to say, but we focus so often on the big campaigns and the Dunkirks and the Normandies and the Arnhems and the and the Midways. And actually, there's fighting all the time. And some of these little smaller 
And I don't mean small at any kind of disrespect battles, can't just get lost and fallen by the wayside a little bit. And I think it's really nice to bring something um, to, to an audience that is a bit different. There's, there's a couple of people commenting that they just didn't know anything at all about Hong Kong. They just hmm. knew it was taken, knew the Japanese had it, but didn't have yeah. any idea about how the fighting went. So yeah, it's I hear nice that. to do some of that. I hear that all the time <laughs> when everyone's like, oh, what do you do? Or, you know, what's your topic? And that kind of thing with my PhD. I hear that all the time. It's like, oh, yeah, it was terrible. And what happened was terrible, but they don't yeah, know. I'm, I'm assuming a fair few Canadians do Vimy Ridge. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's not get into that. But uh, yeah, <laughs> that can that can be its own show. But uh, yeah, but yeah, I know you're right. It's 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 and it's great to see, like, get this sort of tactile video that Craig is providing us is is it's it's mine it's like mind blowing to me because I have not been able to to travel just because of COVID and financial reasons and all that kind of stuff. No, Hong Kong like, is not cheap. One of my friends who who put me onto a couple of contacts there said, yeah, you know, you have most people who go to Hong Kong, they're either really rich or they're going there on business. It's, it's an expensive place to go and spend a couple of weeks if you're a student. Yeah, you know, it's a, I I mean it's 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 just yeah, it's kind of it's kind of awe inspiring to me uh, that 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 Craig is able to provide this view. That I've only ever been able to even read about it. You can't see this online. It's it's fantastic. Well, that's the Sorry, thing I was saying before we went online. If those watching, if you just Google search Battle of Hong Kong or Jardine's Lookout, there, there's very little photos come up. Very little information really is there. Um, yeah. And so this is what we're providing. Sure, people who are watching my shows, they've often been to Pegasus Bridge or they've been to the Baston Woods, but Hong yeah. Kong, I'm assuming most people watching this haven't been to Hong Kong and have no immediate plans to go to Hong Kong. So what we're doing is is really amazing and um yeah, again thank you two guys for doing it so um um how i mean how often do you come up to this area yourself craig um at least a couple of times a year i mean um ab about 10 years ago i would have been up here quite intensively looking around going down all of the gullies and streams and going where you really shouldn't be going um, <laughs> but i kind of uh, ease that back now and i'm kind of moving on to other kind of locations and stuff but uh, no i've done i've done this area pretty extensively and there's quite a few people there today enjoying this enjoying this nice you know, weather just after Christmas. Fantastic. Yeah, well, it's uh, coming up to half past three in the afternoon. It's a lovely Sunday day. So everyone's out having a, a walk about, trying to burn off a few calories that they might have uh, put on over the, the last couple of days. Yeah, well, we don't talk about that in our household. <laughs> I ate about a plate of gingerbread men last night. But anyway, anyway that's another story. So, um, yeah, Brad, tell, tell us more about the fighting. Yeah, where we are now, the Jardines Lookout and... and, and fill in some details while we're moving between locations. Yeah, so moving down um, closer to, um, as Craig already mentioned, kind of the headquarters of West Brigade. So just qu real quickly, they had uh, split uh, the command of the garrison into two brigades um, after the evacuation of the mainland. Uh, yeah, sorry, great. that's a great shot there too. You can kind of see Beautiful. the city um, and the hills there. There it is again. Uh, it, it's Sorry, again, it's just it's so spectacular to see. It this. is, isn't it? Beautiful. It's no, fantastic. So, so, so this is uh, Mount Nicholson. And then over here, this is uh, Mount Cameron in the background on the right there. So that's Mount Cameron. And that's pretty much as far west as the uh, the Japanese got. Um, just behind that hill there was where pretty much the last lines were on uh, December 25th. So, yeah, yeah. Those, are the, those, those are about as far as the Japanese went. Yeah, pulling back because after the, yeah, again, again, the garrison had pulled back to another uh, a gap in the hills trying to hold them off, uh, but the attack never came because the surrender uh, came the next day. So, um, sorry, what, what was it? Oh yeah, the fighting going on at this time. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, it's all good. Um, I'm, I'm enjoying it. Don't worry about it. this. Is this is this is guerrilla filmmaking? It's all good fun. Yeah, this is this is fantastic. I mean, I keep saying that, but this is this is great. Um, yeah. So um, Craig talked about yeah the landings and they're pushing through trying to get to the headquarters. Uh, well, they're trying to get to the gap. They didn't know necessarily that it was. The headquarters uh, of West Brigade, um, which was right in the center of the island. So such a crucial point. That's why the headquarters were there. That's why the Japanese were attacking that direction. Uh, and the fighting was at its most intense. Uh, as we'll see, we'll get further on. Craig mentioned uh, D Company uh, of the Winnipeg Grenadiers had their uh, headquarters uh, on the other side of the road uh, from the uh, headquarters uh, by uh, Brigade, uh, uh, Brigadier Lawson who uh, was the uh, West Brigade uh, commander um, and the fiercest fighting, uh, uh, some of the fiercest fighting of the whole island is over there in the span of a day or two. And there was, you know, but we'll do it later, or, or, but there were some amazing stories of valor, despite, despite the fact that it was all going to go one way after a certain point. Some extra extraordinary tales of people, you know, doing incredible things to just hold on and, and um, you yeah, know, Victoria Crosses and, 
and um, desperate actions and military crosses. It's amazing stuff. It's, um, you know, you, you can't admire the heroism in these in these situations. Yeah, yeah. yeah like, actually, we were just near. We were where I first started, and where we uh, where we got to greeting to each other. And um, the 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 VC was actually one about two three hundred meters away from that kind of location, but totally in the wrong direction. So we would not have managed to get that no, out today. No, no, no. Yeah, it's not easy to get to. Um, but yeah, the speaking of of um, Company Sergeant Major uh, John Osborne's uh, Victoria Cross, yeah, was one um, with self sacrifice. Uh, they had been surrounded grenades being thrown into the, the building and he jumped on one to save the men around him. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a classic kind of comic book. I don't mean that with any kind of disrespect. It's a classic, you know, standalone action that the Victoria Cross is absolutely for, for in my opinion. You know, that kind yeah, of, it, yeah, nailed on. That's a Victoria Cross, bang on, yeah. It, exactly, and I mean, to the Canadian viewers and if anybody else knows that we have quite famous heritage moments that run on TV uh, or online now um, that cover cover things in Canadian history, but that is one of them uh, uh, kind of recreating what Osborne did uh, at that exact moment. Another incredible view there. We are heading down to Cecil's Ride, which is what the Japanese actually took. Um, as soon as they landed in North Point and on the Hong Kong East Island area, then they, they went halfway up the hills and then Cecil's Ride actually kind of joined Hong Kong from the east to the center here. So we're just about a hundred meters away from the actual path that they took. Yeah, so that's kind of where uh, D Company uh, of the Grenadiers is trying to stop the <laughs> advance uh, undermanned again, like I said, uh, and obviously not successful. I mean, they did their best, uh, but again, it was it was very difficult, uh, just again for numerous reasons. I mean, and, and defending a hill like that, there's a, there's a kind of a point in the early. I'm talking general terms is that the early point where the guys on the high ground have the advantage, but as things change, you can't get resupplied, there's no ammunition coming in, then the people attacking going up start to have advantage because they can at least bring supplies up. So you kind of get that classic bit where it kind of swings from being the defender's advantage to the attackers. And I'm guessing these battles here had that kind of similar moment where, you know, when you're standing there on high ground looking down, you think, hey, we, we can defend this, we've got to look at that view. And then, and then it sort of changes when the, the pressure just keeps on unrelenting towards you. I mean, exactly. Yeah. It's it's uh, it, it's no no guarantee either, right? You have issues of of morale, um, or if the wounded, right? Uh, just yeah. again, it count, counts. Uh, all it takes one well placed mortar round, right, and you can take out a good number of soldiers, and that's what happened a lot to to the D Company soldiers uh, trying to defend that area. Just they were so wounded sometimes so quickly uh, that they would just melt back because they basically had no choice. Yeah, more mortars. We we you know, we talk about a lot on these shows, and I think they're often forgotten by people watching war films and things because they don't really show mortar very often. But mortars kill you know three quarters of most men in combat in most campaigns in World War Two, don't they? Really, generally, and you know, and it's and the Japanese were the fifty millimeter, very light weapon, very very portable, very accurate, and in this kind of close close quarters, not close, but you know, they're not there. It's it's a short range mortar, not a long range, just devastating. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we are now walking along Cecil's Ride. So this is the the, the very path I think the, the Japanese were walking four abreast along here. I think at one point there's some uh, a few photos taken a little bit further behind me, but uh, no marching in good order. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic stuff. So I mean, Brad, when you're doing your research, well, how much is there to find? Because you said yourself, you know, most of these guys are POWs or they were killed. So what? So so what is there when you're trying to under, uh, you know, understand what was ha happening in these last ditch moments? Uh, do you have to fit in a lot from your own kind of logic, or is there enough to work uh, on? There's quite a bit actually. Uh, and, and again, like you, sorry, going back to what you said before, mentioning kind of the the, the individual uh, stories and heroism that, that took place. Uh, a lot of them kept diaries of everything that was happening and had to keep it hidden from the, from the Japanese captors in the POW camps for years, uh, kind of keeping these their accounts of everything that happened hidden, um, which I, it was to me was an invaluable source. I found so many and I was lucky enough to be able to travel to the UK twice uh, for research and found accounts I'd never seen mentioned. Uh, Again, like I mentioned, quite a lot of controversy with this battle, but uh, yeah, one of the more iconic uh, paintings of the fighting there. 
Um, yeah. That one there, but, that one there, the the, uh, the Japanese uh, taking that's pillbox one. So that would have been the first one that we would have taken uh, uh, just uh, ten minutes yeah. ago. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, sorry, going back to the uh, the research. Yeah, there's accounts I'd never seen. Uh, again, some of them are used for reasons of trying to protect prestige, reputation. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an important part of how the Hong Kong story is told. Uh, again, uh, it's way too much to get into right now, but uh, that is an element, Canada and Britain and elsewhere, uh, of how the story is told and what is, you know, conveniently, you know, left out from accounts that probably should have been included. Yeah, well, that's that part of the war, that part, that era of the war, that early when we, yeah, you say it's all about at the British face and prestige at this point, and there's lots of things mm. going on, decisions, and that, that were perhaps made at a higher level that weren't as good as they could have been. So yeah, there's a, a certain amount of um, shuffling and, and 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 tidying up of the accounts to make things look a little bit less less awful than they really were. Right, and and as we're moving down, we'll we'll discuss it again. But the Brigadier Lawson, the com commander of I already said of the West Brigade, but also the ranking Canadian in Hong Kong, the the commander of Sea Force, is killed um, very early in the fighting on the nineteenth. Uh, again, we can talk about that story again um, coming up. But uh, and it's been argued by many, uh, including myself, that kind of the Canadians lost their you know main voice, their kind of you know the cheerleader after the fighting. Uh, yeah, kind of, yeah, yeah. Uh, that one, you know, who should have been their spokesperson. And a lot of the high command Canadians are killed uh, in the fighting and in the POW camps. They die as well after the fighting and the, uh, after the battle was over. Yeah, yeah. Well, a little bit older, I suppose. The, brigad the brigadiers, things are old, you know, they're going to survive it less well as on the on meager rations. Again, anyway, we go off the different subject now. But um, yeah, yeah, I know this is, I can't, I can't, I, I can't express how, how, how much these images are. They're, they're really impressing me you know okay there's a bit of jerkiness with the connection but i mean it just to be live from hong kong is just it's just really exciting so yeah this is really good stuff so where are we coming up to now craig uh we're following Sir cecil's ride so this yep. is where the japanese would have come across either uh, earlier on there about uh, two kilometers behind me on the on the ride there was when they first got into a bit of an encounter on Sir cecil's ride uh, there were two different positions there that were manned by the Hong Kong Volunteer Defence, and they were just holes in the ground, gun pits they made very hastily, so it wasn't yes. like any fixed uh, positions as such. They were overrun pretty quickly, so then the Japanese came along this very path, and then about 200 yards in front of me was a third position, also manned by the Hong Kong Volunteer Defence Corps uh, 3 Company, which was a specialist machine gun company, and they'd also built a gun pit with, uh, I believe it's a Vickers gun inside it. And uh, yes. this is actually one of the most understated parts of the war, actually. I mean, this, this section here with, I think it was nine men, uh, I think it was Ma, uh, Ma section. He was in a gun pit here. I mean, they hold off a whole regiment almost for about half an hour. And, mm -hmm. you know, by the end of it, I mean, the Japanese had to outflank them and then do a bayonet charge on them. And I think out of the nine occupants, I think there were five were killed and three were badly wounded. And I think only one of them managed to, to, to bail away. I think it was only Ma himself that managed to bail away. But just those, that act alone for half an hour holding off you know, hundreds of Japanese soldiers along here. I mean, the Japanese accounts of what happened to them in this in this gully around the corner is pretty horrific. So, uh -huh. uh, and, and it's not very well stated. Not many people know about this one particular little uh, battle amongst uh, a lot of other things that was going on. Yeah. What about it, the Hong Kong volunteers, Brad? Who, who, who would they have been? Uh, a mix of everyone in the colony. Uh, they are British expats, um, local... Uh, Again, these are older terms of, of kind of racial identity. So they're called Eurasians, mix of East Asian descent yeah, uh, with yeah. uh, British uh, ancestry, usually uh, a lot of Portuguese uh, immigrants in Hong Kong uh, formed their own uh, platoons, in the, in, in, I believe, in, in one of the companies. Um, and again, they're, they're, they're mixed units that are in charge of the artillery units that they have, machine gun, uh, a company mentioned already. Uh, quite a few. There's a uh, another section that is older vets of the First World War uh, that managed to hold off the Japanese near where they're landing uh, for a very extended period of time. Uh, these older gentlemen that were able to really uh, be a thorn in the side of the Japanese attack and the accounts of, again, getting a bit off topic, but again, the accounts of that fighting are, mm. are, are, are just... Um, are just tremendous to read of what they were yeah. able to do. I don't do. think it is off topic at all. I mean, you know, they're defending their, their, their homes, they're defending their families. Exactly. So it's, there's a lot to fight for, isn't it, in that situation? It's, it's so, um, yeah, no, I think it's important to cover. Yeah, a lot of them were fighting for, yeah, for their families, for, the, for their homes. Um, and again, that was to their advantage in a lot of ways. Uh, they knew the island. Yeah. Uh, they knew 
what they were dealing with uh, and who the people were and everything. So that is used to their advantage later on. Um, a lot of them are able to escape and get out of the island uh, uh, prior to the surrender and even after. Uh, again, and I, and I guess stories. also, you know, we're, we're, yeah, the, the British and Canadian soldiers, they perhaps know that if they, if they are captured, they'll be taken to prison of war camp. But for the the, uh, the expats, and you just said, the, the mixture of races and Euro, Eurasian, they don't know quite know what's, if they get captured, they don't know really what's going to happen to them or their families, different colors, different mixes. They don't know how the Japanese are going to react to that. So I guess it maybe spur you on to keep on fighting because you just, the, the alternative is an unknown. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, the, and again, the, the atrocities uh, committed by the Japanese are, are well known now, but also during the fighting, the, the, the story sped fairly quickly uh, of what the Japanese were doing uh, to civilian and, and, and military alike. It's, uh, uh, again, those are, are horrific to read, but um, those, those stories kind of, yeah, spurred a lot of them on. Again, those accounts, those who were able to get out yeah. Um, again, kind of speak to that of kind of what's pushing them to keep fighting and to, to keep living, um, especially after the battle has ended. Yeah, no, it, may, it makes sense to me. And, I, and, and that's that I've never been to Hong Kong, but that 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 sense of being a multicultural society, which it has been and still is. And so many influences, kind of like almost like Malta in that regard, isn't it? Or that, that there's so many influences from so many different places there that all kind of live together. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's not a it wasn't a, you know, a, a perfect picture of racial, no, you know, no, no, you know no, harmony at course. the time. Uh, no, of course not. But uh, uh, the British Empire clearly um, had its racial hierarchy. Um, but again, yeah, like you said, it's it's this mixture of people that you don't really see elsewhere, particularly early in the Pacific War. You, you don't see that um, kind of no. people fighting in that way or who've been there forever, their whole lives or decades and coming from somewhere else. But uh, yeah, it's kind of got that unique element to it, too. And and, and again, obviously, now the, the island is more built up than it was at the time. But there's that element of, of urban warfare as well. that yeah. you don't often see. Uh, until I guess later the fighting in the Philippines, but uh, it's kind it's, of a, it's, in some ways, from what my limited reading and prep for this, it's kind of almost like a uh, an example of a, of a lot of fighting around. You know, they so say urban fighting, hilltop, plains, jungle. You know, small unit, yeah. large unit. It's there's kind of a little bit of everything there, isn't there? Yeah, um, exactly. There's uh, yeah, just real quick. Yeah, there's a mixture of all the kind of fighting. But again, we could talk about that as we move further down. So there we are. So, so Craig, where are we now? We are right opposite uh, West Brigade headquarters. So uh, where the petrol station is, that SO petrol station just to the left, which we're going to get to in about five, 10 minutes. That is where Lawson's bunker was. And he, he went running out, running out on about the 19th with a pistol in each hand and uh, sadly got uh, gunned down by a machine gunner, probably standing not too far away from where I am across the valley. As soon as he came dashing out, they saw all his red ribbons and epilepsy and everything like that. So that he was the first one to get uh, targeted. So yeah, he's, he was to the left of that station. Where that kind of clubhouse is in the corner of the field there, that was, would have been where D Company's headquarters would have been. And you can't see it, but a little bit further down the hill again, there's another couple of shelters, which we'll also get to shortly. So just carry on heading around, and yep. I'll show you that gun pit where uh, uh, three, uh, three company uh, volunteer defense were and uh, inflicted some heavy uh, casualties and uh, damage on the Japanese. It's just around this corner. Brilliant stuff. Thank you. So, Brad, I mean, without sort of dwelling on it, I mean, the atrocities, you know, run through a couple of examples just for people watching just of how, how brutal things could get there. Uh, quite brutal. Uh, it's, it's sad, but there's just so many. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to pick uh, okay. one. Uh, there's, well, we, we didn't get a chance to really talk about it at the beginning, but one of the earlier buildings Craig was showing us at the beginning of the video is known as the Black Hole of Hong Kong, like the Black Hole of Calcutta and the various other black holes that have occurred in British Empire history, um, where they shoved hundreds of men into such a small area. The and, then, and then once the, the, the fighting in the area, yeah, there's the, the, the photo from the time, uh, hundreds of men crammed in there. Uh, and then the, when the fighting is over, uh, those who couldn't walk out on their own were, were killed, uh, uh, outright murdered, bayoneted, uh, with this taken to the by the sword all that kind of thing it's just again sorry it's a bit difficult to talk about after researching this for so long but uh, no, no, it's, 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 it's just you know i just want to a little, a little bit of just the the, the 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 finales of these battles are so different to some other battles we talk about where there's mm. sort of almost a handshakes and right after the off the prisoner war cage for you uh, it's it's important it's to contrast the different types of battles we get in in world war ii and understand that that, that brutality 
is there and unfortunately it's a it's a it's a huge part of the pacific campaign it's a it's a it's a big part of yeah like you said the whole campaign but particularly this battle um there's another one i don't want to infamous i guess the best word to use uh, at saint stephen's college uh, on yeah. the east side of the island is is probably the best known uh, of of massacres of of uh, right you know bayoneting wounded in the beds uh, raping and murdering the nurses it's just uh, it's just this whole the barbarity of it is 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 quite mind boggling even for someone like me who's been studying this for years i'm still yeah no it's you, know, you could yeah those accounts there's the, they still shock, even if you read them before, even if you've been studying these things like I have a long time. You, know, you read some of these accounts; they're still, they're still, they still turn you sick to your stomach. And um, yeah, it's just, but it's it's important to to keep reading them and understand them and 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 put them into place as they were the context of the war. And exactly, um, yeah. So um, Craig is coming down. There's uh, the, the and for those watching, by the way, Craig is covering some real distance on this. That's why it's shuddering <laughs> a bit. I mean, we. We were thinking it's a 45 minutes to an hour for this. I mean, Craig will have burnt off a few calories. I'm just sitting in my chair in my office. So it's, it's a lot <laughs> easier for me than it is for Craig. So it's, it's a little bit hard to tell. It's very overgrown. I'm going to try and get in here. But basically, this is the vantage point. So just in here, there is a gun pit. It's very, it's very hard to see. It's just up there. But I will try and get it. But literally, as the Japanese marched around in order around that corner that we just got, yeah. uh, we waited for them to get to about halfway to about there. And then we just opened up and literally just wiped out a whole line of them down there, which then caused the Japanese to bunch up just around the corner, which then opened them up to PB2 from above. So this whole area here was a right old killing ground for a good half an hour. I think it was 6.30 mm. to 7.30 um, in the morning on the 19th, I believe it was. And I think there was only one, only one person that wasn't wounded or killed in this position. And I think he managed to flee over the hills and managed to get back behind his own lines. But I'll try and show you the pit, even though it might mm. not be very uh, uh, visual today. No, but it's all about being there. It's all about the sense of it. You know, we can't see. Well, this is it. And it's sort of semi, semi concreted line. They managed to put something yeah. in there very quickly. But I mean, yeah, sadly, there's a little bit of rubbish here. But also what's also interesting just here is where the Japanese actually cremated all of their soldiers that got shot in this area. And even up until a few years ago, there was lots of, uh, well, here you go. It's clearing here. And I don't know if you can see that depression in here. Right. Um, that's literally where they, they, they buried, you know, sorry, they cremated 50, 80 men in this area here. And wow. uh, quite often you'll come up here and there's like a little sake bottle over here. Oh, in fact, there's one just over there. Somebody's somebody's come up here with some sort of respect and mm. you find little sake mm -hmm. bottles around here as well. But no, all around here, you'll, you'll find little shards of uh, charcoal and bits of burnt stuff like that. But uh, no, I really wow. try to leave this area alone. I don't really go anywhere near here. Yeah, no, fasc fascinating and sl slightly macabre at the same time. It's, um, I mean, Brad, my, my takeaway from this is, is, is that my initial reading of Hong Kong is kind of that every unit was overrun and very quickly. There, there was some, they, they, they were defending pretty well. I mean, they, they, they weren't going to come out of it victorious, but as, as Craig right. said there, they, they picked their locations. They, 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 they held up for a considerable time. They took lots of Japanese out on their way up. They, there were moments of, of, of really, really um, good tactical thinking. Right. Uh, and I was going to mention earlier, but this is a good part as well, that the, the effectiveness uh, of the machine guns, the, the, the Vickers, yeah. an old gun, um, especially at this time, but an effective gun. Uh, they were able to use that to its full advantage. Um, again, I spoke earlier about the, you know, controlling the passageways, as we're seeing here, how vitally important they are. Um, the, the use of them, the able of number of casualties they were able to cause the Japanese to delay attacks, to slow up entire regiments, as Craig said, with such a small handful number of soldiers. Again, a pre gone, you know, a foregone conclusion, but they were able to really hold on way, way better than they should have been able to. Mm. So just, just for those watching, I mean, how many, how many defenders were there? In, let's take Jardine's lookout, for, for example, how many Japanese do you think were attacking? So just give an idea of the, the balance of numbers there. Uh, well, yeah, it's hard to say again because the numbers change and it's so difficult. But uh, again, I think Craig gave you an earlier description of a handful of basically a platoon that's undernumbered. Yep. I mean, under, sorry, under, under reinforced, undermanned um, of around, I've read accounts of 
platoons taking something an entire regiment was supposed to take. Um, that happens quite often. Again, on the other side of the island near Stanley, uh, that happened quite frequently. But in this area, again, a handful of soldiers, 10, 15, could hold up hundreds, um, particularly if they were well armed with the Vickers or even the burn, uh, the Bren gun, sorry, was able to mm. cause quite a number of casualties. And again, one of the things that kind of gets forgotten is they were well stocked in ammunition, small arms ammunition, lacking in other areas, but lots of small arms ammunition that were able to cause high numbers of Japanese casualties. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's funny because two weeks, you know, roughly for the taking of Hong Kong, in some yeah. ways sounds really short. And other times it sounds a lot, if you consider how quickly the Germans moved across France in 1940, how, how quickly they went across Norway or Denmark, you know, mm -hmm. two weeks is not, it's not, it's not a bad effort at all, is it, really? I mean, it's... You know, it's really not. I mean, it's... It, yeah, again, it, these things are important in context. And as we're seeing the terrain, again, it's just, it just plays an important part on what happened. Uh, and again, they were able to do with what they had and, and who they were. I mean, the Canadians, as I know the best, obviously, with the fair number of combat that's actually in the units, the older NCOs and the officers, et cetera, uh, but the British units as well, well-trained, have been doing, been in the colony for a long time, knew it very well. And then as we were talking about earlier, the the, the local defense forces fighting yeah. for their yeah. homes. Uh, and then the Indian units, again, don't get enough recognition for what they were able to do in Hong Kong. Their, their, their stands against the Japanese are underrepresented. In well, I think the Indians don't get enough recognition in the entire World War II campaign. They, they? Don't. You know, the 14th Army and, and Burma, and uh, you know, I'm hoping yeah. to address that with some shows next year about the 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 the, the, the Commonwealth, not just Indians, you know, the other other parts of the Commonwealth that just kind of get overlooked in the kind of the the, the white version of history. Yeah, I mean, and Hong Kong is a perfect, you know, kind of a microcosm of that because um, the Indians units were able to, well, they were some of the best trained and best experienced, um, yeah. what they were able to do. I mean, they had been kind of had lost the good chunk of their leadership because of the changes the Indian army was undergoing. But uh, anyway, but uh, yeah, they were able to cause a lot of casualties to the Japanese, especially yeah. when they were given time, a short amount of time to even catch their breath in the slightest way. Yeah. Right, we're just around the corner now from the police station that uh, saw, uh, well, changed hands a number of times. We were talking earlier on about uh, the, the guys on the high ground taking, having the advantage, and then it's slowly changing, uh, sh uh, changing dynamics. Well, this was a prime example of what you're saying there. I mean, at the moment, it's a private residence, but back in 1941, it was a police station. And uh, yeah, no, it, uh, it was heavily fought over just in front of us past those trees. I'll get you in a sec. It's superb. So yeah, that, that you know we, we've seen the you know, the the epic stands and where a, a, an understrength platoon or, or or section can do, hold off hundreds for a while, but you know that we, we all know that as we're doing this show, there was going to be this end, and that and that we're, we're not going to go into kind of politics of the surrender and stuff like that because that's kind of a, a separate subject. But how how, how did things yeah. kind of come to an end in this area? Uh so yeah, th again, sorry, this is a great, another great shot to kind of see is. how these, this is coming, uh, kind of see the changes. Yeah, because seeing again, I've seen the photos of, of the time um, over and over and you over You don't again, even appreciate but... how steep they are from the photos. I mean, I'm looking up at it. I mean, I'm only about 20, 30 meters away, but I'm talking about 20, 30 meters below it already. So, you know, trying mm. to get up there to assault it, whether somebody's already fixed in in a, in a good position, it would have been a bit of a hard time, I would have said. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah again, the number of times it changes hands is just... Again, we can read it, but again, it's just when you see it, it's it's like it's a bit harder to put into words of how that went, how what those men had to go through to do. It's that. that simple thing. As people like James Holland always say, you know, until you've seen a battlefield for yourself, you'll never fully understand it. You can get yeah. nearly there, you can get ninety percent there, you can read all the morning reports, the after action reports, but there's nothing like walking the ground. And okay, we're not walking the ground while Craig is, but we're at least seeing it. And okay, the image quality it's not high resolution, but it's it's giving me a huge insight into just the, the, the nature of the fighting here and, uh, and the, the steepness of the trails. So that's PB1 and 2 where we were just up there along that ridge over there. So yeah. we've covered up the ground down to here. There's actually a PB3 that was not even used, which there's a bit of controversy about that. And <laughs> you can't even see it. It's kind of through those bushes above the, above the, above the, the, the bus stop there. But um, perfectly good pillbox just was not, was not manned during the battle, which is a... Uh, Kind of puzzled a few uh, historians of why, because it would have been a pretty uh, valuable position to have. So, briefly, yeah. what's your what's your explanation for that, Brad? 
without going um, off onto a huge tangent. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, that one's a. Uh, uh, difficult to kind of say, uh, yeah, trying to go on that tangent, it's hard, <laughs> but the, you know, the issues of discipline and who ran and when, and who wasn't doing what they were supposed to be doing, okay. that kind of thing. It's, it's, it, again, I, that's, I haven't focused on that pillbox, but I've read quite a bit and, it, and it's a lot of the same thing you see with the whole battle of yeah. Yeah, people running when they said they didn't run or, you know, that kind of thing. Well, here we are. So, I mean, we're, we're coming towards the end of the show now and um, always good to finish at a monument. So this is, well, tell us about the monument. When, when was it put up, Craig? Well, I'm not sure exactly when it was put up, but I do know there was meant to be, it was to commemorate um, a massacre. We were just talking about massacres. In fact, I can talk about it as we head down to Lawson Bunker. And just down where I was pointing to you, where, where the bunkers were, we had um, across the road where the petrol station was, was uh, West Brigade head headquarters where Lower Lawson was. Um, on the eastern side of the road, just where the cricket field was with D Company. But then just above D Company, there was an uh, advanced dressing station. And that was manned by a, a number of the Royal Army Medical Corps, but also uh, stretcher bearers by the St. John's Ambulance. And on the 19th, I think it was, don't quote, it could have been the 20th, but I think it was on the 19th, they were pretty mm. much completely surrounded. And, you know, you hear these ter horrific stories of uh, the, the, the medical staff and stretcher bearers in there trying to, um, you know, d d show that the Japanese that they're actually unarmed, they're medical. They were putting white blankets out with, you know, blood red crosses on it and stuff like that. But like every time they tried to open up the shutters and stuff, the Japanese would try to throw in grenades or, or bot uh, shoot down there and stuff like that. So they were actually trapped in there for, for a good nearly a good near day. And when they finally did come out, um, I think only, I think there were two officers. I think there was Captain Barkley and a chap called Evans. I can't remember his rank. They were the only two Westerners that managed to escape. All of the Chinese uh, and ambulance, uh, uh, sorry, all the ambulance drivers and stretcher bearers were all put to death as they, as they walked out. So that commemorates that kind of uh, massacre Terrific. just there. Well. And we are coming just up to Lawson's bunker just around the corner now. But it looks very tranquil today out there on the field. But uh, yeah, it, uh, it holds a, a dark history. Yeah, not on the day. No. Well, that's the, that's the thing with a lot of our shows. You know, the, you, you go there now and there's people putting out washing, walking their dogs, cars driving past, people making pizzas, whatever it would be. And you know, then how many years ago there were, there were horrific events there. That's, you know, life goes on, I guess. It's, um, it's good that these, I mean, I, I think it's good that people are hiking that track. Good people are going there. And if, if, if occasionally they read those information boards, if occasionally they remind you of what happened there, I think it's good. Good, good that these stories aren't forgotten. Yeah, I think that's, that's how I like to think about this too. If they're one in 10, think about it, or one in 10, look a little more into it. It's, yeah, I mean, it's, it, we it's get worth it normally with you know, people think, well, there's a golf course there now, or there's a so and so, there's a, you know, a bungee jumping pool, whatever it would be. I, I'd rather people go there than not go there. If it all exactly. just gets overgrown, forgotten about, that's no good. If people are going there for a different reason, but while they're there for that different reason, like going on the beach to, to you know, for, to, to swim or surf, whatever, if they're learning yes. the history as well, that's all going to be good. So well, this is, this is, this is um, yeah. So, well, tell us where we are, Craig. Well, this is West Brigade headquarters. So yep. Brigadier Lawton and uh, uh, this most senior, uh, uh, senior ranking officer in Hong Kong at the time to be killed. Uh, he was running, this is the notice board there. What's interesting is actually because he was such a high rank and because he was in the middle of the fighting, uh, the Japanese were actually very impressed with this. They did not expect a man of that rank to be in this area. So they've actually, they actually put up their own uh, commemorative uh, plaque there to, to, to remember Lawson, which is a little bit strange. Yeah, the, yeah, the story of Lawson's death uh, in, in the, after the war, um, General Malpi, who was in the overall uh, commander in Hong Kong, uh, writes in his dispatch about how his last communication with Lawson is him saying he's going outside to fight it out. Uh, again, different accounts. Craig already mentioned he was said to run out um, from the door into a hail of fire um, with two pistols in his hand firing away. Uh, another account uh, says that's not the case. But again, these things are hard to verify, yeah, yeah, hard yeah. to know. Um, but uh, just real quick, an, an account um, from the uh, the chaplain uh, of the Winnipeg Grenadiers after uh, he's taken prisoner finds Lawson's body. Uh, and just again, the description of the state he finds it in. Uh, I tend to believe that he did go down fighting um, because his body was so riddled with bullets. Mm. Uh, and that's that strange and, thing. You know, we talked about the Japanese brutality, but in that they had that same, 
if someone had gone down fighting, they could turn that savagery to respect really quite quickly. It's a very odd, almost paradoxical thing with the Japanese. There is it? It's good to get your head round, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's like I said earlier. It's I'm I'm I, I don't really have a even kind of an analysis or even a sort of answer to why that happens. Uh, I yeah. mean, there's there's the account and after the war with the war crimes trials about well they did it, but other than just saying they respected him, there's not there's no connect between what you say, like we talked about what you see here with Lawson and being buried with full honors or, yeah. and then what happens at St. Stephen's three days, uh, four days yeah, later. It's, 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 it's just, it's a strange, it, 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 it's a contradiction, isn't it? But, I, I, but it's worth talking about. It's interesting. I mean, we don't have to understand these things. It's just inter interesting to talk about them and understand that, that, that things work differently. And it's that, that Western Asian mentality back then that's very different yeah. for us to kind of get our head around. And, uh, Which is a subject that's been discussed ever since. And, yeah, exactly. And, yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's just, yeah. So I just wanted to speak again about this kind of this location again, lots of Canadians sure. have heard about it. I mean, Hong Kong's not that well known, but known well enough and kind of how important this position is of where Lawson is killed and kind of what that means for the battle of Hong Kong during the fighting. And afterwards, like I already mentioned with the POWs, again, we could talk about that possibly another time, um, but also after the war and all that uh, it's just um, it's, it's quite remarkable again, to see these videos, but also that it is now a, you know, a petrol station is, yeah. it was quite interesting to learn that when I finally, you know, really dug into the map of today. It's, it's, it's quite interesting to see how these it's things. It's where the staff car was. That was actually a car park during the war as well. Probably not as big as that, but that's where, uh, uh, yeah, the staff would have parked all their cars. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so, no, yeah it's, D it's, Company, D Company would have been in about that location there with the ADS just above them, roughly where that uh, pavilion is now. But that's obviously all flat now for a tennis center. Yeah. I'm, I'm amazed by how quickly it goes from kind of jungle trail to urban city <laughs> in a matter of kind of a minute of walking. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, uh, I guess that's Hong Kong, isn't it, I suppose? And this is the last station on the, on the route. Right. Nothing of a major importance here, just another set of shelters that would have been in support of uh, the uh, brigade headquarters. But good to see people reading the information panels. Good to see people out there looking at this stuff. It's, it's, it's good that this history is left here. I mean, Hong Kong has had many, many changes in the seven decades since World War II. And, and it's good, but good, good to see this stuff hasn't been ripped out and torn out. And, uh, you know, it's good, always good. So, um, yeah, so, well. I guess we're coming towards the end of this now. So, I mean, Craig, Brad, Brad what are your kind of your, your, your closing thoughts, what we've done today and um, anything we want to finish off about this action? Uh, you can go ahead, Craig, if you want to go first. Um, I think it's been a great, great experience just walking through it with you guys there and sort of uh, putting you guys' eyes on it and giving you a few little bits of pieces that uh, you might not have already known before. So, uh, no, I think it's been a good day. Um, I hope uh, this story gets out there and uh, I think there is a growing amount of interest in these kind of stories there you know 10 15 years ago walking around hong kong and people like oh what are you doing and we kind of tell them like oh what there was a battle in hong kong whereas these mm -hmm. days now as you can see people have got a lot more interest they're a lot more uh, aware of it and you know they're a little bit more curious about what actually happened so let's hope that that continues and more knowledge and uh, 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 good stuff comes out of it yeah well i mean that this is why things like this you know as we said at the beginning of the show you know with three different time zones we're out i'm a brit you're a brit there uh, brad's in canada it's good that we be able to do this and bring in the people watching this in sweden right now so we're we're we're, we're bringing this history to theoretically every corner of the globe and that that's 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 fantastic and i i'm so excited to do this so so brad you know where, where so, sum up um this the the, the battle for jardine's lookout uh again speaking earlier this is the this is the possibly the toughest fighting uh, that the, the garrison sees, um, what they're able to do. And again, as we mentioned, stalling the advance, not changing the outcome as we know it, but able to stall it again, knowing what they were able to do is not known enough. I mean, again, mm. right here, it mentions the surrender uh, in the area, but also the surrender on, on Christmas day is what, takes up most of what the story of Hong Kong is. Yeah. And again, this, and, I, and I've explored this in my own work, is the suffering, uh, and rightfully so, that should be focused on, but the suffering of the men uh, as prisoners of war um, kind of gives this, 
I like to say like the best way again describing it in English is this sort of negative you know view of this that it's all horrible it all went wrong but there are stories like we mentioned with with Osborne and all these and with the uh, third company of uh, of the local volunteers is is things that get lost in the shuffle I would say so mm. being able to have someone like Craig on the ground bringing us these images um, and then we can talk about it uh, is, is amazing that we can able yeah. to do this when we couldn't have done I mean, it. Yeah, I mean, as I say, in my, my little summary of books I was reading, it just said Hong Kong invaded December the 8th, Hong Kong yeah. surrendered defense December the 8th. And that was, like, that was it. I was like, what about the middle bit? And the middle bit wasn't <laughs> talked about because this is a, 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 a summary of the whole Pacific campaign. It's like, okay, yeah. but there's, you can keep expanding and, and widening and going to more and more stories. And if you two guys exactly. are winning, we can do more stuff in Hong Kong. It's been good. So, if you want to spin the camera around with yourself to say goodbye, Craig, and then we'll 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 kind of round things to an end. So, um, but it's been absolutely good, extraordinary stuff. So, um, well, um, I've I've enjoyed it. Um, I hope well, Craig says he has, Brad has, he has. Those watching it said there's great show. So, um, that's really good. So, um, thank you very much for watching, everybody. In terms of what we're doing on World War Two TV, we've got an interview with the Pearl Harbor survivor to our evening on the 28th and 29th is our Star Wars World War Two crossover show, which I'm looking forward to. Don't forget to join us by uh, clicking subscribe, join up by uh, becoming a patron and we can get bring more of these shows to you. So um, as I say, I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. So thank you, Craig. Thank you, Brad. So Brad, you can go to bed. Craig, you can go <laughs> yes. off and have dinner. I might go to bed again. I don't know. I haven't decided yet. All my family will sleep. Um, whatever. Um, it's been brilliant. So um, thank you very much, guys. I'm going to end the stream now and don't forget, you know, check out the subscriptions and check out the patron page. So Thanks very much, everybody, for watching. I'm Paul Woodard for World War II TV. See you all again very soon. Outstanding. Bye-bye.